This is Dan Schneider, and on this edition of the Dan Schneider Video Interview, I am talking with a paleontologist and evolutionary biologist, biologist named Nick Longridge, and I discovered him on a YouTube video in a debate that we'll talk about a little bit later on. But coming up now, we're going to talk about Nick's career and how he got into his field. And I am talking with Nick Longridge. Thank you for uh, agreeing to be interviewed, Nick. And uh, as I mentioned, I had in a debate that uh, I'll discuss a little bit later. But in looking up uh, your history, you seem to have been well in Alaska. Uh, it seems uh, you spent some time in Canada. Now you're over in England. Uh, were you the typical boy that uh, had, I know when I was growing up, you were a little bit younger, with the, there was a how, why, and wonder books of dinosaurs and stuff. Uh, were you just enraptured by the big lizards? Or? I mean, I, I did have a lot of those books, sure. I think, I don't know that my interest in them was excessive, uh, you know, for, for the age. I kind of, it was something I sort of maybe kind of, I don't know if it, maybe kind of grew out of a bit and then kind of grew back into, if that makes any sense. And I've always been really interested in nature. Uh, I grew up doing uh, tide pooling in front of my family's house in Alaska, going down and flipping over rocks. I'd uh, hunt for bugs. I'd collect plants up in the Alpine and, and you know, dinosaurs were just kind of one more aspect of that. And then I got uh, really interested in evolution in high school, actually, uh, reading books about evolution, reading books about paleontology. And the, the thing that really appealed to me about dinosaurs is that you're looking at evolution on long time scales. So you see things that happen over periods of a million years, 10 million years, 100 million years, that you couldn't really infer from looking at modern ecosystems and looking at what we have today. You can't really understand how did birds evolve flight or where did birds come from just by looking at modern birds. So that was sort of the interest in fossils for me. And what part of Alaska were you? Were you along the coast along British Columbia or up near the Arctic Circle or where? Oh, uh, it's it's uh, in the Gulf of Alaska on an island called Kodiak Island and I oh. opened it. Um, uh, the town of Kodiak. It's got about 10,000 people there. Uh, there's no roads to the island. You have to either fly fly on or off, or or take a ferry to get there. Uh, and it was it was a good place to grow up. What is are there glaciers there? Because I know as a with dinosaurs, but with glaciers and Louis Jassy and the study of glaciers, is there a big glacier on the island or not? I think there's a little glacier like tucked away up in the mountains where you can't really see it. I've never been there and I've done a fair amount of hiking up there. So uh, it's, there's not a lot of glaciers. There's, I mean, it's probably not what people would think of, think of when they think of Alaska. It's probably what people would think of if they think of British Columbia, say. It's very, you know, it's very wet. It's very rainy. It's very cool. The summers aren't very pleasant. Uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of an Alaska. It's a marine Alaska. Yeah. Uh, so no glaciers, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, once you got to say be a teen, did you always uh, w was was being uh, working with dinosaurs or in archaeology, paleontology? Were you already fixed on that, or was that something that came later to you? Uh you know, it was something I really kind of got into in high school. I started reading books about them. I started reading some of Stephen Jay Gould's books on evolution and paleontology. Uh, I started reading about debates about the extinction of dinosaurs and the origins of birds. And uh, I think there was a, what was it, uh, Gregory S. Paul's Predatory Dinosaurs of the World really excited me. Mm. I think part of it was the artistic aspect of it. I've always been an artist. I enjoy drawing. Ah. And a lot of these paleontologists did incorporate a lot of artwork into what they did. And that was something about it that sort of excited me. Uh, you know, uh, Bob Bacher's book, uh, Dinosaur Heresies, really kind of got me fired up. And I liked how he had kind of provocative, interesting ideas. And... Uh, so there was kind of, you know, it was partly dinosaurs, it was partly a certain flavor of paleontology that was going on at that time. I thought, you know, it was a very, you know, creative field. A lot of things were happening, a lot of debates were going on, and it uh, just seemed like an exciting thing for that reason. And you know, there's just kind of a bit of a rom romance and mystery to it. Uh, you know, these dinosaurs out in the field. Uh, I first went to a, a paleontological conference, I think right after my senior year of high school, and it was... Uh, I think in some ways it was one of the biggest letdowns of my life. Uh, in, what, I, uh, in what way was it? With just a lot of people, you know, just gabbing in in, in techno speak or dino no, speak. I or, liked that part. Yeah. I liked that part. Uh, I I, I liked some of the people were great. Uh, 
I, I, I got into a big argument with a, a very prominent paleontologist about the end Cretaceous mass extinction. And, but what really kind of struck me was that, like, uh, you know, I was, well, I was out in the field and we were looking for dinosaur bones, and we came across one. And it was this small black cylinder, this kind of tapered at either ends, like an elongate spool. And it was the, the caudal vertebra of a diplodocus dinosaur, like in a, either a brontosaurus or a diplodocus or something. Yeah. And Jack McIntosh, who is the world expert on sauropods, uh, you know, looks at these. He's like, "Oh wow, that's fantastic! I've never seen anything good, that good in the field before." And I'm like, "That's it." And it just seemed like so underwhelming. And I'd been picturing like these giant articulated skeletons, and I was looking at like, yeah. "Wow, this is really hard!" And like, there's not much out here to find. And like, I just like, I just, it just seemed to, I don't know. I kind of it. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I was thinking like, you know, lots of big skeletons like you see on the, in the museum in New York. Yeah. And I thought it'd be all about you're working on that type of thing all the time. And you just, those things are jumping out of the ground. And I, it just seems so underwhelming. I just kind of assumed right then and there that I, I really liked paleontology, but I didn't think I could ever be a paleontologist if that's what I had to go on. And I just thought it would just be, uh, so I, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't until I got into college and started going into museums and looking at fossils and reading papers about it and, developing my own ideas, I, I realized it was something I wanted to do. Yeah, I actually, uh, you'd mentioned Gregory Paul. I actually did a written interview with Gregory Paul a few years ago, which uh, you can find on my website if you ever have a chance to look at it. Um, okay. It's quite interesting. Um, but uh, so uh, after the, the initial interest, did you also like go back uh, and, and read on the history of things? Because I know as a kid, uh, I would read, you know, I, I wasn't really like a, a geeky nerd kid. I grew up in New York. I wasn't out in the wilderness like you. But I, I remember reading uh, Lyell's Principles of Geology and then yeah. uh, the Marsh and Cope Bone Wars, reading about that, yeah. and then about Wilberforce and Huxley debate. I, you know, I, I read Origin of Species, and Darwin is, an, is, an, is a writer and a thinker I really admire a lot. I, as, a, as a scientist and a person, I think he's somebody of, you know, in, incredible insight, and I think there's also a compassion to him that comes through in his writing. So he was somebody I, I read, and I, uh, for the most part back then, I wasn't so much interested in the history. I was interested in the new things that seemed to be happening, new debates, new fossils. Uh, and it's kind of over time I've developed an appreciation for where everything comes from, and, you know, what it must have been like to develop the science back when you were Marsh or Cope, say, and, and yeah. what Marsh did that was extraordinary, uh, not all that extraordinarily good. Um, you know, how things progress in the history of science, it's something, I think back then you're, you're kind of, you're young, you're excited with new things and the idea, and you know, how, how the guys did things in the old, olden days seemed a lot less interesting to me, and, and over time my appreciation, and, and you know, going through and reading like some of these guys, and you know, there's, uh, you know, guys like Gilmore, who's maybe not a famous name these days, but he just did a lot of really, really good descriptive work. And a lot of times, if you want a paper on, say, a Lamasaurus, Gilmore's is still some of the best stuff out there. And he, you know, he did a lot of work, you know, helping to find things, describe things, uh, you know. So I, I, I've come to appreciate, uh, uh, you know, who's the guy at, at Princeton, Jepson, who did a lot of the field work finding these mammal localities. So there's, there's a lot of kind of, I think, like sort of unsung heroes, if you you start going back and reading papers and you start realizing like wow this guy did some really important stuff and so I feel like as my career has progressed I've, I've developed a deeper understanding of an appreciation for the history that you know when you're young you don't maybe don't appreciate that stuff quite as much yeah uh, we'll get into a little bit you mentioned uh, getting into an argument and uh, one of the things that I uh, when I first uh, uh, discovered uh, your video is uh, I, it did put me in mind of the of the, the Wilberforce Huxley type of debate where from years ago, and uh, I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, okay. so, uh, uh, why don't we end this uh, segment? And when we get back, uh, we'll talk a little bit more before we get into that. Uh, we mentioned before we started about uh, you seem to be centered a bit on the Ceratopsians, and and most most people who grow up there are amongst the the groups of dinosaurs that are most interesting to look at. So why don't we yeah. take a break? And when we get back, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, Nick, uh, I had mentioned that uh, you seem to, from what I've looked online in the last few years, had a lot of involvement with the ceratopsians. And for those who may not be familiar, that's the triceratops, that's the great horned dinosaurs, the Styracosaurus, and, and you know, the old uh, famous uh, knight painting with the uh, T-Rex going at triceratops. Uh, 
is, is that a focus of yours or the Ceratopsian lineage or is it just something that uh, over the last two or three years you've just sort of has come uh, come about? Well, it was just sort of something I stumbled into. It wasn't really something I planned on and then I kind of, you know, once I got into it, I, it was kind of easy to keep going. Uh, you know, I, I ran across this I, I just kind of tried to familiarize myself with all the dinosaurs and the dinosaur park formation, which is I was going through there and trying to find new things. And I was mostly interested in the, in the theropod dinosaurs at the time, but uh, I was just kind of interested in the general problem of how many species were there and how do they change through the formation. And so I started familiarizing myself with other things out there. And I was in the basement of the American Museum of Natural History, and I ran across this frill fragment down there. And uh, this frill, and I looked at it, and I wonder what that is. I was just sort of curious about it. And I thought, you know, it, it kind of looks like a Chasmosaurus, but it's not right for Chasmosaurus. And it kind of looks a bit like a Pentaceratops, I thought, but it's not right for a Pentaceratops either. And then I realized it was, you know, quite possibly something new. And so I started going through the Tyrrell Museum collections and found more and more specimens of this new thing, uh, which ended up becoming Mojoceratops. And, you know, wrote up that paper. And in the process of writing up that paper, I started running across additional things that I didn't know what to do with, and so more new species. So it was just sort of, it wasn't necessarily a grand plan, so much as one thing turn, leads to another. Yeah. Um, now, have there been other lineages of dinosaurs? I, I noticed, too, that you had found what looked like a small uh, raptor kind of dinosaur recently. I saw something. Uh, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's, there's Hesperonychus, uh, and there's another one which, you know, not really a raptor, but Albertonychus. And Hesperonychus is a really cool animal, and I started going through the Tyrrell Museum collections and running across these little claws, uh, little talons, and they're the sickle claw. There's a, a blade-like retractable claw on the, on the second toe in the dromaeosaurs, the raptors, things like Velociraptor and Deinonychus. Yeah. But these are really tiny, and they're, they're small enough that they just about fit on a, on a quarter, uh, American or Canadian as the case may be. These are Canadian specimens. And everyone had always assumed these, these things are like either juveniles of a big raptor like Stormphalistes, or they're birds. And I looked at them, and I'd, I'd learned talking to paleontologists like Phil Curry that you could identify whether a dinosaur was mature or, or a juvenile based on the bone texture. Is the adult dinosaurs have a highly finished kind of glossy almost uh, ceramic like texture to the bone it's very very dense and smooth and the juveniles have very porous bone and these these little claws had a really dense bone texture and I looked at them and I said these look like the adult of a very small raptor and they've been finding similar things over in China for a long time and I figured well why can't we have them here and so I sort of launched off into this multi-year quest to find more of these things and eventually hit on uh, you know this little piece of a pelvis that was able to prove that yeah we have these tiny raptors and they're they're related to these Chinese four-winged raptors. Uh, so I mean it was a really fun discovery, but uh, you know the the fossils are so rare that just sort of ended right there. Uh, where the Ceratopsians they're just they're really abundant. So you know after the first one there's lots of additional papers. And yeah. now you mentioned uh, a couple of times. Uh you know, sort of scrounging through collections of bones. Are you basically then a, a more of a theorist rather than a field guy? Or Well, I, I think a theorist would mean I don't actually look at data. Uh, I look at raw data. I look at the fossils, but I don't, I spend most of my time looking at the fossils in the museums rather than collections. And I like field work. I've spent, you know, long field seasons out in Dinosaur Provincial Park. I, I got, I was, you know, lucky enough to get to the Gobi Desert and with Phil Curry and look for dinosaurs out there. I've been to the field in uh, New Mexico uh, and other places. And it's just never been something I've really excelled at. And uh, I don't think I'm a bad, I don't think I'm a bad field paleontologist. I've never been lucky enough, though, to be in the type of place where there's just bones of new things left, right, and center coming out of the ground. It's, uh, and so it's just been kind of a, a bit of a conscious decision that, like, you know, I can, I could go spend weeks and weeks and weeks running around the field trying to find things and, and you know, and I, I've done that and, you know, okay, I, I've got a, a Brachylophosaurus, but we have a bunch of those. We have some pretty nice ones, actually. Do we need another? Uh, it was just a lot more productive to spend that week going through museum collections, processing what other people had already found. So I, I like field work a lot. It's a lot of fun. I have a, a huge amount of respect for the people who do it, but just career-wise, it's made a lot more sense to focus on analyzing what we've already got. Uh, 
Now, uh, just to, to segue, uh, you had mentioned a bone texture, and that, that actually, uh, in the initial video that uh, made me aware uh, of your career, uh, yeah. there was this particularly devastating moment. You Just to set the scene, you were debating for about an hour or so with uh, a well-known uh, paleontologist in America, Jack Horner, and Horner has uh, been, uh, for the last decades, along with Bob Baca, probably uh, you know sort of the twin titans of PBS idea of uh, the paleontologist and uh, the basic uh, debate was whether Taurosaurus and Triceratops were juvenile and adult versions of the same dinosaur or not and uh, when you were debating with Horner basically he promised to have a lot of evidence here or there and he was in a lot of ways evasive and you had one particularly devastating moment that even if someone was going to in my opinion say that it was a draw then I, I thought you were clearly winning the debate uh, but you have you had a photograph of like a an almost oval shaped bone and you had a, a, a line in the middle of it on, on the upper half it was well, I think on one half it was it was sort of Swiss cheesy looking the other half was was uh, dense and you know you sort of set stringing it along and the, the and then you removed the line and showed it was the same bone and there was like an audible gasp in the audience and it was it was just one of those moments that I that just uh, as someone who, who enjoys dialectic and debate I was like it's over I mean uh, and uh, and and I, I don't mean to harp on the point but it, it was just a, it was just a, a terrific moment because when I've watched when I watch on YouTube uh, science debates it's always Richard Dawkins beating up some idiot uh, eight, uh, uh, not uh, religious people. Where this was yeah. actually real science, and it's something that yeah. a young person should actually see. So anyway, if you want to just talk a little bit about that debate and how that came about, and, and what the general uh, argument uh, between uh, the Hornerites and uh, people like you were. Yeah. So, uh, so Jack Horner and his, his colleagues have been. Uh, promoting the idea that some of the dinosaurs out there that we identify as separate species are actually just either adults or juveniles of known species. And there, there, this is definitely something that does happen. Sometimes you dig up the adult, you dig up the juvenile, and they can look really, really different. And you just go, ah, different species. Uh, Nanotyrannus is probably a case of that. It's not 100% sure, but it's there's no compelling evidence that Nanotyrannus is anything other than juvenile T-Rex. It appears to be juvenile. It looks a lot like a T-Rex. It's related to it. Um, other examples, I think some of the pachycephalosaurs, uh, I would say that probably Draco Rex is probably a juvenile or a female of Stygimoloch. Um, the pachycephalosaur Hamalocephaly, which is sometimes considered to be among the most primitive pachycephalosaurs, I think is either a juvenile or a female of, of Prenocephaly. So, Definitely, this happens. I, I don't. I don't think, though, that this is the case in Triceratops and Taurosaurus. And so, the reasons being is that we don't really have, in my opinion, any compelling evidence for intermediate forms between the two. And you know, nobody's been able to show that Taurosaurus. Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> or rather, we do have evidence for immature Taurosauruses. And so, if Taurosaurus is just a grown-up uh, Triceratops. There shouldn't be any juveniles of it. There should be only adults. And what we found is some juveniles. And so Jack had been pushing this idea, and you know I thought it'd be kind of fun to kind of push back on it a bit. And uh, you know I think partly it was just I, I kind of didn't like the idea, and I you know I kind of wanted to you know put a critique of it out there a bit. I think you know and also at the time I was uh, hunting for a permanent academic job, and I didn't figure that you know picking a fight could <laughs> I figured it, it couldn't hurt my career. So that was maybe a bit of a cynical ploy there, but like uh, you know it is what it is, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, again, I feel that this is definitely something that happens, but in this particular case, it's not something that's borne out by the facts. You know, we need to find, uh, things that are intermediate between Triceratops and Taurosaurus, and we have it. And there's like a couple hundred skulls out there. I think if it existed, we'd have it by now. So, yeah, and uh, let, me, let me just, as a layman and someone who grew up looking at dinosaur books and you know again I'm a layman I'm 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 I'll, I'll defer to experts here or there but when when an argument is laid out kind of clearly and it it, it sort of jives with you, some th some things sort of click and there were three things in in the debate that for me uh just as a layman you seem to 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 uh, sort of uh lay out as well and the one is that that adult triceratops uh, were as big as Taurosaurs. Uh, Taurosaurs may have had a, a longer uh, 
neck frill, but they were not generally noticeably larger on on average than triceratops the second was the yeah. nose the nose horn of yeah. the triceratops and the third one was that that the triceratops frill is shorter and has a pronounced turn upward and i yeah. don't know uh, of how how that would flatten out th- through time to be the more flattened and and so just just as a layman it it and i'm not a dinosaur expert i'm not a, yeah. a, a scientist but that just seems to me me be Something that you know, uh, if you have pentaceratops, there's the two little horns that come down uh, yeah. uh, on, by the jowls, and you know you could you could say, well, did <coughs> that is that just an adult uh, triceratops? But have any triceratops even got the, you know? So the, these were just yeah. those kinds of things that, as a layman, uh, and if, if it's obvious to me, you know, it, it would seem to, I don't know, maybe I was predisposed, but uh, do, were those obvious things to you as well that uh, you think you that, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit tricky. I mean, size can be a bit tricky in the sense that sometimes you can a- have an animal that hits basically adult size and then some weird things start happening to the skull. So, I mean, pachycephalosaurus seem to do that. Um, they kind of reach full size and then go through kind of a, some additional maturation. Uh, you know, a, a deer gets pretty large and then it grows antlers. So the size thing isn't necessarily uh, fatal, I think, to the argument. But there are things that are, are really difficult. And, you know, the the reason for that name, Triceratops, that famous long nose horn uh, that's only found in, in one of the two species of Triceratops, well, you never see that in Taurosaurus, uh, so it would have to shorten the nose horn, uh, and that's an important thing. There, and the fact that there are these two species of Triceratops, one of the long, one has a, uh, one has a long nose horn, and one has a short nose horn, but Taurosaurus doesn't do that. It only has a short nose horn. That's really strong evidence, I think, that it's not. If it was just a Triceratops, it should have both morphs. It should have the long horn and the short horn, and it doesn't. And the, the frill shape is, is a big thing. The curvature is important. Uh, and something it seems like it would be a kind of minor little detail, but it's not, is the number of little scallops on the back of the frill. Each of those is a bone associated with a, with a scale. And like, so it basically tells you that different numbers of scales on the back of their frill. And that might seem trivial, but the number of scales is fixed in the embryo. You hatch out as many scales as you're going to have. You don't make more over time. So that's actually, you know, you can fuse bones together and things like that, but scale number is something that's pretty inflexible. The fact that they have different numbers of scales on their frills really tells you a lot. And that's actually how people tell modern lizards and snakes apart. They'll count the number of scales on the lips or something or the number of scales on the back of the head and say, ah, they have a different scale count, a different species. It works for them and it works for dinosaurs. Yeah, I, and also for people who are more lay than I, um, you know, if, People often associate uh, Triceratops and, and Ceratopsians with uh, rhinoceroses, uh, but the yeah. difference is a rhinoceros's horn is is not made of bone. And I could I could conceive of some kind of mechanism at maturation, perhaps you know retaking back the the fibrous uh, what whatever it is, the keratin or whatever it makes a rhino horn. But it would seem to me, I, as far as I know, again as a layman, there's there's just no mechanism that would do that in bone. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. So- <clears throat> there, so there is actually potentially a mechanism for that. Yeah. Curiously, enough, is there is there when we do see this, and in dinosaurs like Centrosaurus, they start out with short horns over the brow, and as they get older, they lose that. Uh-huh. But we can also see we can also see how that happens. They, they start developing these great big pits and holes, and the, the horns turn all like kind of Swiss cheese or something. Uh, to get rid of that bone, you have to resorb it, and that leaves yeah. a trace. So you can see that it could happen, but if it if it does happen, you're going to see it. And what would happen is you'd have a long triceratops nose horn, and it would get resorbed, and you would see kind of the pits developing, resorbing that horn. And the adult, and then, mm. then it, as you resorb it, made it shorter, it'd be really rugose and pitted at the end. Mm. And you don't get that in Taurosaurus. There's no evidence that's resorbing the horn. So I don't think it. I don't think it was resorbing the horn. I think it's it. It started out short, stayed short, and uh, Triceratops got long in, in some species and, and stayed long. And that's, I mean, that's what the fossils say. I mean, it's, it's science, so you can always be proven wrong. The nature of scientific truth is that it's contingent. Uh, nothing is ever proven 100%. You know, yeah. you could get a fossil tomorrow that overturns everything. Um, but, well, you know, so far we haven't, and we've sampled a lot, we've dug up a lot. Now, I mean, if we find those fossils, I'll, I'll say I was wrong. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. It's, you have to be willing to say, I'm willing to be proven I'm wrong given this data. 
And if you can't do that, you're not doing science. And so that's kind of what we focused on in the debate is what would it take to prove me wrong? And, uh, and you know, I laid out what we, I thought we needed to do. And I feel like at this point, we don't have that. And what, I, what I'm really looking for is transitional fossils, things that bridge the two species. If we have those, I'm willing to concede, okay, one could turn into the other. And so far, we don't. Okay, uh, so let's end this section and uh, in our next segment, I want to talk more about, say, the role of public intellectualism uh, yeah. in general and uh, maybe uh, a lot of the silism that abounds on the internet, not only uh, uh, in paleontology but in science in general, and then also talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, some some of the more uh, uh, mass appeal uh, theories that have gone on in, in dinosaur uh yeah. circles for the last 20 or 30 years. So we'll do that in a minute. All right, Nick, um, why don't we start out actually talking about the dinosaurs and then uh, we'll work our way sort of uh, towards uh, the idea of public intellectualism. I know uh, when I, I was born in 1965 and when I was growing up, dinosaurs were like the old uh, uh, night uh, paintings, you know, you'd see Brontosaurus in a swamp with his uh, neck sticking out. You'd see Brachiosaurus underneath a lake with, uh, like he had a, a blowhole yeah. on top. And uh, But then came the 80s and came people like uh, Horner and Bach and you had ideas about, uh, I, I remember seeing Diplodocus with a, a trunk. Uh, there was ideas about if uh, the KT media hadn't hit that dinosaurs, certain dinosaurs may have developed uh, intelligence. What is the current state of some of these sort of more uh, I, I don't know if I'd say far out, but these sort of more speculative uh, uh, things. Do, do, is there any evidence of dinosaurs with lips, for example? Uh, you know, no evidence for lips as far as I know, although I think there's some decent evidence for cheeks in some dinosaurs, uh, no evidence for trunks. Uh, last, I, you know, no super intelligent dinosaurs. It's difficult to rule out that possibility. Um, I mean, it, but it's easy to kind of point, you know, uh, some of these ideas... You know, it's easy to kind of point out some of the ideas that we now regard as a little more kind of speculative and out there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there was also at the same time, there's a lot of really, you know, kind of innovative ideas people were throwing out there that, you know, have been proven proven correct. And, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, guys like uh, Bacher and, and Greg Paul were drawing feathers on dinosaurs. Yeah. And was, oh, that's, you know, really speculative. And like, and, uh, you know, lo and behold, we've got them. And, you know, Greg Paul was drawing great big giant wing feathers on his dromaeosaurs. And, well, now we have winged dromaeosaurs. So I think, you know, I think a lot of, you know, there is this attitude that, like, I kind of remember sort of every, I think there were some excesses maybe. But there was also, like, you know, there's this attitude that, like, oh, serious scientists, we don't speculate. We only deal with facts. And it's like, well, how do you come up with new hypotheses if you don't speculate? And yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, okay, well, you know, you know, there's this idea that you don't want to speculate and then be proven wrong, but how do you ever be proven right about anything interesting if you're never willing to be wrong and put yourself out there a bit and throw out an idea? And, uh, you know, I think, you know, and I mean, it's, it's really kind of a tragedy that, that, I, that Dale Russell is so closely associated with the dinosaur right, which I think was just kind of a moment of fun for him. You know, his real contributions, he was, the, he was one of the first people to point out and say, look, if you look at the fossil record, the extinctions of the end of Cretaceous are very rapid, they're extraordinarily severe, they're worldwide, they're on land and at sea. He starts, he says, I think there's a catastrophe happening here. He was one of the first people to really seriously talk about the extinction of the dinosaurs and other animals as being a mass extinction driven by catastrophe. And so, you know, that same creative mind that was willing to consider something at that point that was completely inconceivable also came up with something we maybe think of as a little bit silly, like hyper-intelligent dinosaurs. Uh, you know, but it's kind of, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, yeah, you have to come up with some, yeah. you know, new, progress means thinking of new ideas. It means thinking of things that people haven't thought of before. And that means thinking a bit out, you know, thinking in a bit of a different way. And so I think, you know, I think speculation is good and it's healthy. I think the problem is where you come up with a neat speculation. You start saying, well, I have this neat idea and it's, it's just true because you have to test these ideas, but yeah. I think the speculation is an important part of it. I know the one I, I mentioned Charles Arnida, sort of an, uh, sort of an avatar, old way of thinking. But he did have one painting that was quite famous, the Laylapse painting, where you had two uh, yeah. uh, Laylapse uh, dinosaurs, sort of active and, and and trying to 
uh, rip each other apart. So uh, getting back to feathers, though, um, is it then now pretty accepted that feathers developed on dinosaurs as insulation and then they were ancillarily used uh, when as dinosaurs, uh, you know, developed more bird like features? That's what the evidence suggests now is they we're not sure where in dinosaurs they evolved exactly. They either evolved a, a long time ago in the earliest dinosaurs and then were lost in some groups uh -huh. or they may have evolved independently as many as two or three times. I mean, so we have dinos we have feathers in uh, or hair like structures in pterosaurs, uh, heterodontosaurs, which are small herbivorous dinosaurs. Uh, we have them in there's a there's a thing called Galindodromius, a small ornithopod that apparently has them some bristle-like things in this tachosaur, and then pretty much all the all the solarosaurs and maybe even tetanur and theropods all seem to have had some sort of hair-like or feather-like structures. So they may have evolved three or four times independently in archosaurs, or they may have been present yeah. and then lost. And then in certain groups, they appear to have elaborated these feathers uh, to create, create airfoils. And so they basically have this integumentary structure that they start using as a wing. And just so people know, an archosaur describes not only dinosaurs, but the, the reptiles in the sea and ter uh, pterosaurs as well, uh, right? Uh, archosaurs would be the uh, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, crocodilians, and a variety yeah. of distinct relatives, yes. Yeah, and you mentioned hair-like structures. I, I was going to ask, now I believe it's therapsids that were the ancestors of mammals. Is there, yeah. is there something different in, in the, the skin structure of therapsids versus early dinosaurs that may have made therapsids is more likely to have hair-like structures and develop fur and whereas dinosaurs I, I know we're going back to the Triassic and there's probably not that many good skin uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know collections or whatnot but is there is there something that that maybe why dinosaurs seem to have developed feathers versus you know hair, or, or are there going to be dinosaurs that are discovered with fur do you think well uh, you know, it, it does seem like the Things like, say, the uh, Tianyulong, the little heterodontosaur, uh, and it, it's it's small. I, I saw the fossils recently, and they're about the size of a of a rat. Uh, it's a really tiny herbivorous dinosaur, and it has these structures. They're just they're just long fibers. They might be hollow inside, but they're very very simple. And you would call them you would call these things fur, probably at least functionally. It's a fur. It's not really a feather. It's a and. Uh, and it may or may not be related to the structures that eventually give rise to feathers, or it may just be an elaborate scale that it's invented for insulation. It's unclear what's going on in, in some of the other things. Uh, things like Sinosauropteryx, it may have either had single, uh, single bristles, like basically fur-like structures, or they may have been structures that branched at the base to create multiple kind of bristles at the ends. And we, we're not 100% sure, but I mean, birds have something that's vastly more complicated than anything mammals have ever produced. Their fur. They have uh, these extraordinary, elaborate, you know, branching structures that you know they can use as airfoils, as insulation, as streamlining uh, to line their nests. They're very, very elaborate, and this would tend to imply there's something, you know, different about the, you have these, uh, you know, developmental uh, genes that allow you to express and. Uh, express feathers and develop different structures and and maybe the genetic architecture underpinning feathers is more complex than that of, of same same mammals that basically allows them to build more complex complex tools their genetic tool gets more sophisticated and they can make fancier things with it uh, it seems plausible I'm not sure if it's true or not but uh, that would be my guess is that they may have been predisposed to evolve complicated things the way mammals never could. Mm. Uh, let me give two more questions before we get on to public intellectualism. We've mentioned Gregory Paulus uh, a few times and for those who don't know he's uh, one of the premier illustrators of dinosaurs of the last uh, few decades and uh, I had read an article, it might have been online uh, in Discover or, or, or Scientific American or something uh, or, or some science magazine that uh, Someone was proposing that uh, our whole idea of what dinosaurs look like could be wrong because they took they took what if we didn't know, for example, what uh, a sloth looked like from its skeleton, and you know how how could fancifully could a sloth or a grizzly bear or a seal be interpreted other than what we actually see? And I was wondering, do you think uh, uh, our our view of say uh, uh, a stegosaurus, because at various times the plates of a stegosaur have been upright, they've been staggered, yeah. they've been, they've sometimes been laid down on the side, 
Uh, do you think that uh, we might only be 50% right of the way we might view things? Um, not not only because of uh, hair-like structures or, or or sexual displays, but I mean, could we could we let's see if if we could uh, uh, if we ever found in amber, say, a T-Rex uh, blood and could learn how to clone it, we've come up with a creature and say, what the hell is that? That's not what we saw in Jurassic Park. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I guess like kind of yes and no. If you have animals that we have reasonably close relatives of, like say a, a saber-toothed cat, uh -huh. you've got living saber-toothed cat, we've got living cats we can look at for comparison. I mean, it might be different in its fur or coloration or something like that, but it's probably not going to look radically different than a lion or a tiger. Uh, as we start dealing with things that are that are more and more distantly related to anything living, it becomes harder and harder. Yeah. And we have with dinosaurs, we have birds to work with as living dinosaurs, and I think they provide us with a lot of information. But you know, a T. Rex is pretty distantly related. It's not like a it's not like a saber toothed cat versus a, a tiger kind of a thing. It's, it's something much more distantly related, and it's a lot harder to make accurate guesses when the living relatives are so so distant. Uh, we have crocodiles as well. I mean, in, in some cases, we have been surprised, uh, definitely. I mean, the uh, if you look at the fossils coming out of the G-hole biota in China, there have been things there that if you'd, if you'd proposed these animals 20 years ago, people would have laughed at you. They would have, you know, said, you, you can't, you know, this isn't serious science. These things can't exist. You're just indulging in, in complete fantasy if you'd tried to tell somebody that, hey, I think something like this might have existed. And examples would include things like Tianyulong, this little heterodontosaur that, you know, just looks this little rat-sized herbivorous dinosaur with just this long bristly fuzz all over it, or uh, more like bristles than fuzz. I mean, it's a weird, ugly little animal, and I don't think anyone would have believed it if you told them that it had had these filaments, these this fur or feathers or whatever they are, until we had the feather. Another example of this is Microraptor. And it's a it's a, a dromaeosaur, a, a raptor, and it's got wings, and that seems remarkable enough. But it's got four of them. It's got wings on the forelimbs and wings on the hind limb, and this is just outside. I think what anyone would have considered, uh, if you as an artist had drawn this thing, uh, people would have said, well, that's just like going beyond what's you know acceptable, and this isn't respectable paleo art to draw something like this. But it, it clearly existed. So, I mean, certainly in some cases, uh, yeah, this has happened. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I think, I mean, I think some of, some of the things, you know, it may well be that some animals, maybe you'd go back and see a triceratops and say, eh, that's about what I thought triceratops looks like. And I think, I guess in a fairly high number of chance, fairly high number of cases, it's like that. But then there's things like Microraptor and you, you know, that if we'd only had this, the bones, not the feathers, you never would have guessed what was going on. And I think there's a lot of, not just dinosaurs, but a lot of fossil animals that, you know, would really surprise the heck out of. We would go with what we have until we get better information. Yeah. Now, people, when they think of dinosaurs and death, they always think of the KT extinction. But yeah. I, I, I was recently reading about uh, the proliferation of uh, mites and ticks in, in our current world. And I was just yeah. wondering, what do we know about, uh, have there been instances found of parasitism in dinosaurs? Do we know, for example, if there were equivalents of, say, uh, tuberculosis that might have been a plague that might have killed off some dinosaurs in, in a certain area? Do we have any idea about that a Diplodocus lived 250 years, a T. rex averaged yeah. 30 years? Uh, what, if, if you were like a, an actuary at a, a dinosaur you know, insurance company, yeah. can you tell, tell us something about those kinds of things? I mean, the one thing I think we can be pretty certain of is that with, with parasitism, there would have been a lot of it. I mean, you know, life is nothing if not efficient. It finds ways to make a living. And it's a lot more easy to just, you know, kind of hit, get a free ride and, you know, consume the resources of some other organism than get them yourself. So, you know, blood sucking and parasitism and, uh, you know, worms and mites and diseases. I mean, dinosaurs probably suffered from all types of diseases. Uh, what those diseases were, I mean, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, we do sometimes see evidence of injuries, uh, infections. Um, my, one of my colleagues, uh, he'd found evidence for infection on uh, pachycephalosaur domes. It's pretty common. It seems like they, they butt heads and, and kind of injure each other. It gets infected and probably kills the animal a lot of times. Uh, ceratopsians have a lot of infected injuries. Uh, so definitely a lot of infection. Uh, 
Another one of my colleagues, uh, Wang Ying, he's found and, and documented these these giant primitive fleas that lived in the Mesozoic, and they're they can't jump. They're very large crawling fleas, and they're preying on something pretty big. There's no other big animals around there except the dinosaurs back in the back in the days. So they're they're like dinosaur giant uh, dinosaur fleas. Yeah. Uh, and there's, I mean, parasitism is a constant. Lots of different groups do it today. They've been doing it for a very long time. They're very good at it. It's a good way of making a living today. I'm sure it was a great way of making a living back then. Uh, but we don't have a lot of evidence of it. Uh, well, let's talk about evidence. Uh, I'll segue uh, into the idea of public intellectualism. Now, yeah. on, online, do you ever look online and see, because I know there are a lot of popular science bloggers. Yeah. Um, do you, are there some like science blogs that, uh, whether it's on paleontology or other other uh, fields, do you look and just sort of like shake your head? And, 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 and some of these people might even be, you know, uh, uh, at, uh, in academia, uh, do you think oh. do you think that there's a lot of sciolism and a lot of misinformation out there uh, that uh, if you were say you know an eight or ten year old kid uh, today just that you would be lost or I don't mean I kind of I mean there there is some good science journalism out there there's some science journalism that's kind of a little more so so I mean I I kind of feel like that the caliber of science journalism was better like you know. 20 years ago when I was, you know, or, or so when I was in high school. But I mean, maybe, I don't know, you always think things were better back when you were young. So it's like, maybe that's all it is. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess it's really, it's kind of hard to, you know, I guess as a, as a scientist, you kind of always nitpick little details and anything that isn't absolutely right. You get, you know, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think, I guess, I mean, to be fair, most of the people who've, who've reported on my work, I think, have done a pretty good job. I think they've tried to get it right, and I think they've asked good questions and, and you know, tried to tell a good story while getting the facts right. And so I think actually, I guess, I mean, occasionally you see something that kind of makes you roll your eyes, but I guess actually, if, if you ask me based on my experience with the journalists these days, I, I guess I think they're probably doing as good a job as anyone has ever reporting science. Now uh, let's just talk about public intellectualism as, as a whole. And I had mentioned earlier how uh, if you just go on Google and you know try type in science debate, you'll get yeah. ten thousand. You know the Christopher Hitchens destroys a religious person. This person, yeah. Richard Dawkins, this or that, and that seems to be the only thing uh, science. Whereas I, I don't even recall now how I stumbled upon your Torosaurus and Triceratops yeah. debate, but uh, uh, is well, well. Number one, are, is there any like websites or, or uh, any any venues online that actually do have a fairly rigorous science? Not 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 so that you're in doing science speak, but so that the average person can actually learn something scientifically, and that there's a debate yeah. about the science. Not not oh, Venus was spewed out of Jupiter, uh, yeah. you know, seven hundred years ago or something. I know what I know what you're saying. Yeah. And I think there's like, and, and sometimes I run into issues where, you know, even within science, you're arguing with somebody and I, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, this isn't a real debate. I mean, a debate is when you have two, two prop, I, I see a debate, a scientific debate is when there's two propositions yeah. that are both reasonable and supported by some evidence. And in a lot of cases, you know, you have two people shouting at each other and one side has all the evidence and the other side won't concede that the other side has all the evidence. And it's just, that's just, it's like a... I don't know, it's an argument or it's a shouting match or whatever, but it's not a debate, really. And there is a lot of this in the public sphere, you know, things about, you know, people, uh, you know, you know, creationism versus uh, evolution or, you know, religion versus atheism or, you know, global climate change versus global climate change denial. I mean, these aren't really debates in the sense that, like, you know, I mean, with climate change, one side basically has all the facts, and the other side says, you know, I'm not going to listen to your facts, and that's yeah. not really a debate in my mind. It's not a legitimate intellectual exercise, and it kind of, yeah, it kind of cheapens what real debate is, I think. And I mean, there are, I mean, you can have a debate about climate change, you know, how much will the temperature go up, what are the various factors contributing to it in addition to humans. Uh, I mean, those are, there is room for legitimate debate, but saying, you know, is it happening or not, or are we contributing or not, it's not really... You know, we've kind of settled that. Uh, yeah, it's like when I re when I watch one of these, if if I click on some of these, it's like 
I, I, the, the thing I think to myself is Richard Dawkins, and I'll give you just use him as an example. He came up with two really great things. One, yeah. and they were both metaphors. The idea yeah. of the selfish gene, whether you believe it or yeah. not, yeah. is a great metaphor. And then the actual metaphor of a meme. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself, and so what has he done? I mean, yeah, he may have done yeah. some little work, field work in, in his era, but it's like the last 20 years, it's just arguing about Jesus and God. And it's like, put your mind to work on something, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, of, of real depth. It's like, I can say Baca, well, Baca is a, a priest, uh, or not a priest, uh, he's, he's a, a reverend, and, yeah. and yet he doesn't do that. I mean, he would yeah. seem to be much more interesting person to speak to about the, the scientific uh, chasm with with religion. It just seems yeah. to me that a lot of scientists, it's just, you're not going to change these people's opinions. Like I said, yeah. it's not a real debate. And but, it's like, do something productive. Yeah, but part know. of the issue, you know, part of the issue is I actually get really frustrated with a lot of these guys who, you know, the kind of, you know, the, you know, sort of militant atheism or what I would call fundamentalist atheists. Uh -huh. And, you know, if you want to criticize religion, you know, I'm, there's, you know, no shortage of grounds, either, you know, current events or things that happened in the past few thousand years you know, crusades or witch burnings or whatever you want to point, wherever you want to point the finger. Okay, sure. But, you know, I think there's been some good things that have come out of religion. I think, you know, a lot of our, our values, you know, tolerating the unaccepted, you know, that comes straight out of the New Testament, uh, you know, being, you know, being kind to the poor and, you know, the modern welfare state is based on a lot of Jesus' ideals. Uh, you know, so I think we've, I think we've, religion has, you know, inspired some really awful things. I think it's also inspired sometimes our better angels in addition to our, our you know, our, our demons. And to deny that and say, you know, no matter what evidence you present me with, I will maintain that religion is bad and nothing you, no evidence you present me with will ever make me think otherwise. That's kind of the thought process of like a creationist, if you, if you ask me. Uh, if you want to have a legitimate debate, you know, what are, you know, how does religion influence society? Where is it good? Where is it bad? I mean, I think that's you know worth having. But just saying all religion is bad and it's never done anything and anything good, and I all believe that no matter what evidence you give me, that's it's basically turning atheism into a faith. Mm -hmm. And you're you're not you're not you're not tolerating dissent. You're not you know it, you're being intolerant and and you know very uh, uh, yeah you're being intolerant of other people's viewpoints and you're unwilling to consider other people's viewpoints or, or question your own and. It's basically making atheism into a religion. Uh, well, so. let's let's end up uh, this segment. I'll have one final question, and then we'll wrap up the interview to talk about your future plans and whatnot. But uh, yeah. in in that vein, let's say because you, I guess you're in your late thirties. By the end of your career, say 20, 30, 40 years from now, whenever it might be, if there yeah. was like one or two questions about dinosaurs or anything in paleontology that you would love to see solved by the time you're on your deathbed, what would those one or two things be? Oh, man, that's a really tough one. Uh, I guess I'd like to know more about the end Cretaceous mass extinction, although not necessarily dinosaurs, because uh -huh. you know, we basically know almost all of them went out of the boundary except for birds, but what's happening to everything else in the fauna? Uh, I, I think we really need to know more about some of these other mass extinction events. There, there may be events going on at the Eocene Legocene, Centimene and Turonian, maybe Jurassic Cretaceous, definitely Triassic Jurassic, Permo Triassic. These are huge events that are, are shaping the evolution of biodiversity and we need to understand them. Uh, evolution of flight, I think it was probably, I think it was probably a lot more complicated than we think. And I'd, you know, like to, you know, what's up with dromaeosaurs? I would really like to figure that one out. How do they fit into flight evolution? Uh, I think those are the two ones I'm really interested in right now. Okay, well, uh, we'll end this segment, and when we get back, we'll uh, end the interview uh, talking with Nick Longridge. And I would like to end this interview with Nick uh, with uh, asking about his future plans. But before I do, uh, can you just give uh, anyone listening or watching this an idea idea of uh, you know uh, sort of a day in the life uh, do you come in at nine o'clock uh, you have a student that brings you we found this great discovery uh, in Bulgaria you got to take a look at this what they found I mean what 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 is a day like oh uh, I mean it, it's really variable I mean some some of it's you know probably pretty boring and prosaic it's like okay fill out this form grade these papers deliver this lecture uh, the lectures can be fun uh, you know sometimes it's like you know 
you know, meetings with graduate students, uh, you know, I was just kind of, you know, it's not all like, you know, running around in the desert, digging up dinosaurs all the time, you know, research careers. Uh, but then there's, there's some really fun stuff too. I mean, uh, you know, being out at the, being out at the pub with a colleague and he says, you know, we have this amazing discovery, but the paper got rejected. And I stop and I think like, you know, I don't, what you're telling me sounds too fantastic to be true, but if it's true, I really want to know more about it. And, and, you know, following up on that and getting, you know, having a, a, an amazing research project emerge out of that, uh, dealing with that paper, then being rejected and trying to figure out how, what we're going to do next. Uh, you know, trying to figure out how to get labs set up, you know, I don't know, what was that? Uh, yesterday I was preparing the bone of a pteranodon in my lab. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a very thing. I mean, it's, it's kind of anything you want it to be in a way. You walk in every day and you're, you're sort of your own boss and you can work on anything. You can work on the end Cretaceous mass extinction. You can work on lizard phylogeny. You can work on preparing fossils. You can work on writing a review article. It's wonderful. And it's a bit terrifying as well. You know, it's, a uh, you know, it, it's something, it's, it's great freedom, but it's also, it's tricky trying to, you know, figure out what to do with your time and how to best use it. And, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to accomplish? And how do you make sure that every day you're, you're, you're getting a little closer to that and doing stuff that, you know, you'll be, you know, at the end of your career, you'll be able to look back and feel glad that you did the things you did. Uh, it's, well, I, I had asked you about questions you wanted answered uh, on a more personal yeah. level. Uh, 20 or so years from now where do you want to be uh, in in your field uh, I mean have you have you published any books uh, or do you, do you have ideas for books coming out I, I don't know I mean I, I've kind of had writer's block the past few years if that went away it'd be kind of fun to write a book it would be I mean I kind of feel like I really got into this field because of books people have written things like you know Greg Paul's book and, and Bob Bacher's book and and Jared Diamond's stuff and Stephen Jay Gould's stuff and Darwin's stuff. So I think writing is a really important part of that. And I feel like if I was a better writer, I'd like to do that, sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I kind of like, you know, a lot of people I think worry about, you know, what do their colleagues think about him? And I kind of feel like, you know, I want to feel like I've done work that I'm proud of. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't want to say I don't give a damn what my colleagues think, but I don't think you should be doing things because you think your colleagues will like what you're doing or not. You should think that it's important because you want to do it. And like, you know, it's like, you know, trying to be a moral person because you worry about what other people are going to think if you, you know, do something wrong. I mean, you should yeah. do, do the right thing because you care about it. And, yeah. and on the same reason, like, I want to do science that's, you know, not because it's going to get me a lot of funding, not because it's going to get me publicity or, or you know, uh, you know, awards or whatever the heck, which it probably wouldn't anyway, but like, you know, because the stuff I genuinely think is important and is interesting and that's, you know, it's a, it's a hard job. It's a, you know, you got to do stuff that'll keep you, keep you going. And, you know, what keeps me going is, is, you know, making new discoveries and finding out things I didn't know and kind of, you know, doing research and, 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 you know, sort of creating something in a way. I mean, it's not really creating a new species when you describe a new species, but it feels like it's creating something. So. Yeah. So let me give you a let me give you just a minute or two uh, if, to give you some closing remarks on whatever you wanted to to say about uh, either it's paleontology or, or whatnot. I didn't, boy, that's too open ended. I'm trying to think of oh. where to go with that. Any suggestions? Oh, okay. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure to interview. Uh, uh, you, you're very forthright, and uh, I think uh, a lot of people will enjoy the interview. So let me just uh, thank you again for taking this hour or so to speak. Uh, with me. I did enjoy your debates and hopefully we'll see some more real debates in, involving you and other people in the sciences. And for those people who enjoyed this interview with Nick Longridge, uh, in two weeks my next interview will be with a panel of three people talking about the films of John Cassavetes. So we go from dinosaurs to filmmaking and backwards and forwards. And so again, Nick Longridge, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Okay.